Hi, good morning everyone. Uh, we are going to start the webinar now. As you can see, we are going to have uh, three topics today. One is uh, land transport, the other is agriculture, and uh, lastly is an uh, update on last week's uh, March FOMC meeting. Uh, we'll start with land transport, which uh, we published the report last week on Thursday. Uh, the highlights are uh, areas under the review. Areas under review are the fair formula and possible licensing of private hire companies. Uh, there's also an operating regime change for North East Line and Sengkang Punggol LRT, which uh, will move to the new rail financing framework on 1st of April. And then there's the regulatory reviews and changes that addresses uh, profitability and sustainability. That's uh, referring to the fair formula here and uh, licensing of private hire car companies. Uh, so there's a fair this has already been overtaken by events about the fair formula being under review. So uh, we published a report on Thursday morning and on Thursday evening, uh, the PTC had announced their new formula, which includes uh, the operating cost component. Uh, what this means is that there will uh, be a revenue impact, but it's uh, limited to the rail business. That's because the bus business is already on the contracting model. Uh, during the budget debate, uh, the second minister for transport also uh, spoke about the possibility of licensing the private hire car companies. And then uh, based on the statistics, the rental car population year on year growth has moderated uh, and population has actually contracted uh, year to date. This uh, last bullet point also has been overtaken by events. Uh, as you are, should be aware, uh, this morning uh, Grab has announced that they will acquire Uber's uh, Southeast Asia uh, operations and in exchange uh, Uber will get a 27.5% stake in Grab. Uh, we maintain overweight on land transport sector on the basis of um, better profitability and sustainability for the public transport segment. This comes from the government review on changes. So first is the uh, transition of bus uh, to the government bus contracting model. Previously, bus business in Singapore was loss making, but it's now profitable. It's uh, on an asset-like model as well. Then a uh, rail segment has gone uh, asset-like as well under the new rail financing framework. But uh, the difference is that bus, there's no fair revenue risk, but rail, there's some fair revenue risk. Uh, in addition, uh, we see pressure on taxi has been easing uh, and even uh, licensing of the private hire car companies is being explored by the government now. Uh, we maintain buy for ComfortDelGro uh, as we forecast earnings to have bottomed in FY17 and going forward the public transport segment will drive earnings. That's uh, This year there will be the addition of Salita package uh, that's the bus package and then to a lesser extent the Bukit Mira package um, and for rail side the downtown line losses will narrow uh, as the full line has been opened following the opening of downtown line 3 last year. And lastly we see a taxi reaching equilibrium with the uh, private hire car population. So some of the outlook, we start the positives. Uh, the next fare adjustment could be an increase. Um, well, to clarify, this positives is positives. Uh, obviously, is for the business side and not for the commuter side. Um, 
next is uh, worse could be over for taxi as uh, rental cars population has not only moderated but even contracted year to date so um, this year uh, February rental car population actually grew 23% year on year but it's actually contracted 0.2% uh, since December 2017 uh, operating losses for downtown line to narrow in 2018. Uh, I've explained this er earlier. And then the other thing is a uh, northeast line and uh, Sengkang LRT and the Pongol LRT will transit to uh, asset like model. Uh, this means that they will move on to the new rail financing framework and then uh, SBS transit will be alleviated from the heavy cap capital expenditures so that will improve uh, cash flow. Um, there's some mitigation from fair revenue risk as well uh, through uh, revenue caller with the Land Transport Authority. As for the negatives, uh, the NRFF will also incorporate a profit sharing part and that's through the EBIT margin cap and caller structure. So there are some uh, in exchange for uh, not requiring to put in capex, uh, the profit will actually come down a bit. And lastly, the economic mode for rail segment is eroded. Uh, it's become more contestable. How that is, is that uh, the license will be given up for 15 years now uh, with a possible five-year extension. This compared to uh, the previous regime where the license was usually for 30 to 40 years. So this chart on the right uh, is about what we are talking about, about rental car population. So that's the red line. Uh, you can see that the rental car population has started to stagnate here. And the gray line shows the year on year, the monthly year on year growth. So uh, year on year growth for rental cars had peaked at the high 70s region and has come down to 23%. Uh, in February this year. So you can see that growth has been moderating down already. Um, so this table here shows uh, taxi and rental car numbers. Uh, this is February of this year, February of last year and December last year. So for the year on year you compare these two columns and then uh, for year to date you compare here this column and this column for February 1.8 to December 1.7. So you can see for taxi, uh, yes, actually year to date it has contracted 3% and rental cars has contracted 0.2%. Uh, we think that worst could be over for taxi. Uh, but one more thing that we would like to look for is uh, to see monthly year on year uh, taxi population moderate as well. So you can see from this light blue line here, uh, this is the year on year growth for taxi. So it's actually still contracting and it, uh, the, the rate has not moderated and has not found a bottom yet. Uh, okay, so this first bullet point here is uh, overtaken by events also. So as of last week, they had e reiterate that they are not exiting Southeast Asia and they even launched their own carpooling app called Uber Commute. Uh, so we'll quickly move on to the next one. This uh, takeover by Grab uh, could face some reg regulatory resistance in Singapore. Uh, trans the second minister for transport uh, spoke during the budget recently that uh, the government actually wants an open and contestable market. Uh, and so the government has actually signaled that a monopoly is not ideal uh, and having a dominant transport operator may not be in the best interest of commuters. Uh, with this takeover that has already been announced, uh, we can see um, two cases on how it could be beneficial or detrimental to the taxi segment in Singapore. So for the Bull case, um, with only one right higher player, uh, the pricing 
could become more rational for commuter fares as well as driver incentives and then that would uh, shift some demand back to taxis. However, on the bare case, uh, if Grab has a monopoly over the private hire car business in Singapore, then it will put it in a better position to compete against uh, taxis. Last is uh, regulating and licensing of private hire car companies is a possibility. This was uh, brought up by the second minister for transport as well during budget debate. Uh, the current regime only applies to drivers and vehicles, so these private hire drivers uh, need to go for uh, a course and get the license to be a, a driver and then the vehicles are also regulated. You can see that there's a blue decal in the wind windshield for these uh, PHVs. Why this uh, licensing was brought up is because of uh, the explosive growth in the private hire car population and the concern from the government is uh, congestion. So the government would like to license such companies so that they can uh, control the car population. Next we move on to bus. Um, the Salita bus package will contribute positively to SBS Transit this year. Uh, it is a five-year contract which uh, started in March this year and with the option for LTA to extend for two years. Uh, SBS Transit will also be continuing with its Bukit Mera package. Uh, Bukit Mera package, they are the incumbent uh, under the negotiated price agreement. So limited uh, impact from this. Uh, looking forward a bit far further out, that uh, will be the Sembawang Yishun package, which will be the next one to be put up for a competitive tender. Uh, it's currently operated by SB, SMRT buses, uh, and that will be until the third quarter of 2020. For rail, uh, we have said before, losses for downtown line to narrow uh, because of the commencement of downtown line 3. The full line is now uh, operational and collecting revenue. In the past, uh, the line has suffered startup losses because after, uh, before the first stage was opened, there's a startup cost and then after that, there was a startup cost for stage 2 before it's open and now, uh, and then more recently, the startup cost for stage 3. Uh, there was a fair reduction in December 2017 and that uh, would lead to a delay in the break-even for downtown line. So management has uh, guided that they are expecting downtown line to break even uh, in 2019. Uh, the other positive for the real outlook is the fair formula review. So uh, it looks like is there will be an increase in fare. Uh, the transport minister has already said that the current fare formula is inadequate and cheap fares are not sustainable. So commuters will have to uh, contribute their share of uh, the higher operating costs going forward. Uh, again, uh, we clarify here that fare adjustment will only affect rail segment uh, because rail is under the uh, still under the fair revenue model but the bus has gone under the government bus contracting model already. The other thing is a uh, transit of the North East Line and Sengkang Pongol LRT to Asset Light new rail financing framework. Uh, I've mentioned this earlier in the presentation that this will relieve uh, SBS Transit uh, of the heavy capital expenditure but uh, trim the margin for northeast line. So there, with this transition there's a license charge and the license charge structure is identical to what was uh, uh, given to SMRT trains when they privatized two years ago. So first there's the risk sharing revenue caller if the revenue collected is a shortfall of between 2 to 6% of the projected revenue, uh, LTA will share 50% of this shortfall 
and if the shortfall is more than 6%, uh, LTA will share 75% of the incremental shortfall. Uh, as for the risk and profit sharing aspect that comes at the EBIT margin, so if EBIT margin uh, is uh, less than 3.5%, then LTA will share 50% of the shortfall. And if the EBIT margin is more than 5%, uh, LTA will take uh, the lion's share of the profit that's uh, higher than the 5% EBIT margin. So for LTA side, uh, LTA risk is uh, uh, limited to the license charge payable by uh, SBS Transit, but the upside for LTA will be uh, above the 5% EBIT. Uh, cap. Take note that there will not be any uh, special dividend for SBS Transit uh, when they sell the assets uh, because they have said that uh, they will use the uh, the cash to pay off that. Okay, now we'll move on to. Uh, Kang Wei and Jeremy who will talk about agriculture. Uh, sorry about that. I think there was an issue with the, the mic. Okay, let me uh, go backwards a bit. Uh, okay, sorry. We're going to talk about the agriculture, uh, Bloomberg Agriculture Sub-Index uh, just to have a uh, overview of what the sub-index is composed of. It's uh, made primarily of corn, soybean, wheat, soybean meal and sugar. Uh, you can see from the percentages that uh, the sub-index is primarily composed of corn, soybean and wheat. So uh, just a bit of background on why we believe there is a fundamental reason for investing in agriculture right now. Uh, the three main uses of agriculture right now is food, uh, when you consume grain and other forms of agriculture directly, uh, used as feed, livestock feed. So when you grow animals such as pig, cow, lamb, etc., um, you're going to use agriculture to feed those animals, as well as... Um, biofuel in the form of biodiesel or other forms of uh, biofuel you need uh, agriculture in order to produce this kind of uh, either ethanol or biodiesel so uh, agriculture uh, sorry population estimates uh, expected to grow to about 8 billion by 2030 with um, estimate with the UN estimating that by 2050 will add another 2 billion people to about 9 billion population and the requirements for food is going to grow quite exponentially as we grow to that size of population as well as energy requirements so um, let's talk about some of the long-term uh, fundamentals for agriculture. Um, the first off being that as uh, the increasing affluence of emerging markets. So as uh, emerging markets become, uh, people in emerging markets become more affluent, uh, the, the size of the middle class grows and become more wealthy, there's going to be an increasing demand for higher quality food. 
Uh, just as an example, if you look at China, within the years of 2000 to 2009, yeah, China's GDP grew at about 12% per annum. And with that, the per capita consumption of pork also grew at a higher rate of 16.7%, uh, uh, up from 31.2 kg to 36.4 kg. So you can see that as the people in China became uh, wealthier and wealthier, there is a corresponding increase in the higher uh, value, higher quality of food that uh, they are consuming. So instead of eating rice, for example, that, uh, only rice and vegetables, they, they turn to uh, increasing demand for uh, beef, pork, poultry, fish, etc. Uh, the reason why we believe that uh, this is uh, going to have a, a, a increase in the demand for agriculture is that uh, a lot of these grains are used as feed for the animals, but the conversion of calories is not equivalent. So one calorie of grain is, um, uh, if you compare to the amount of uh, grain required to grow one calorie of meat, uh, it's actually much bigger as you can see from the table uh, in, the, in the slide. So um, the amount of, of grain required to produce the same amount of calories for consumption uh, when it comes to livestock is uh, exponential compared to the amount if uh, us humans were to just eat the grain directly. So as the demand for higher value food increases, there's going to be a greater increase in demand for grain as feed. So uh, long term, you're going to see an increase in demand for agriculture as livestock feed as uh, humans become wealthier and we become and we have a higher demand for higher quality food. Besides that, there's also going to be an increase in demand for biofuel. So uh, before the year 2003, the primary driver for demand for agriculture was for food and livestock feed. But since 2003, agriculture has become a substitute for energy source. The production of uh, ethanol as well as biodiesel has uh, started to, to put a demand on uh, agriculture use. So uh, the UN estimates that by 2025, 10.4% of the global cost grains as well as 12% of vegetable oil is going to be consumed by biofuel production. So uh, and that they also expect that the global biodiesel production is going to increase 33% uh, in, uh, from uh, 2015 to 2025 to reach about 41.4 billion liters of biodiesel. So, Besides just uh, eating the agriculture and using it as livestock feed, we are going to have an uh, increased demand for agriculture to be used as a form of energy source. And you can see in this chart below that um, in 2008, uh, demand for oil pushed the crude oil prices up to new highs of about 140 uh, US dollars per barrel. And at the same time, you can see that uh, the corresponding increase in uh, the agriculture sub index where um, there was an increased demand for agriculture substitutes for biofuel. Uh, you can see over here, as well as you know, later on in 2011, again when WTI crude oil hit another high of uh, 114, there was also a corresponding increase in the um, agriculture sub index. So while uh, and then this increase is uh, pertinent to, to this discussion because biofuels became more competitive as a source of fuel, as a cheaper alternative form of energy uh, compared to burning fossil fuels. So in our current situation where, uh, we, are, where we, we used to see, uh, uh, I mean where, where oil prices were decreased, uh, you can see there was also a corresponding decrease in the, the by, uh, agriculture uh, as the demand dropped. But now that oil has started to stabilize and there's been a recovery in oil prices uh, back to about 60 plus a barrel. You can see that uh, there, there's a slight uptick in the, the uh, demand and the prices for agriculture. So as the uh, recovery in oil price continues to, to take hold, I think you'll start to see, a, a, at least in the short term basis, uh, uh, start to increase demand for agriculture as well as uh, uh, increase in price because of that demand as uh, people flock to, to agriculture and biofuel as a cheaper alternative to oil prices. Now, we've talked about why there would be a winds concerning the demand for agriculture. Uh, in the long term demand for agriculture. So now we're going to talk about potential headwinds in, uh, that are, are going to uh, impede the ability of, uh, for us to, to supply that uh, demand in the future. So first of all, there's been a reduction in arable land, uh, land that's being able to use to, for, for farming, for cultivation. 
Uh, and in 2017, the UN actually reported that one third of the Earth's arable land has become severely degraded. That means it's no longer able to keep up with the amount of farming that's being done at the moment. So fertile soil is being lost at the rate of 24 billion tons a year. You can see in the table in the chart below. Uh, this is the amount of arable land in, in the world and in America, Europe, Africa, as well as Asia. And it's all in the downward trend. Um, the reason for that being over farming uh, due to the massive amount of food that's being required by the by by population on earth um, a lot of arable land has been constantly being worked with no chance to rest and this has caused uh, the a lot of the nutrients in the soil to be lost and uh, not I mean despite use of uh, fertilizers uh, chemical fertilizers etc uh, if you don't give the land a chance to to you know um, rest then it's going to reach a stage where there's no there's not going to be any nutrients left in the soil even with the use of chemical fertilizers to to be able to sustain that kind of farming uh, besides that, climate change as well has caused um, things like erosion in the land as well as, uh, you know, desertification of the land where there's not enough waterfall due to drought and etc. Um, also, increasing urbanization, you know, you look at places like uh, China when they're starting to uh, develop from an a underdeveloped market to a more developed country. And you can see that um, they are actually losing a lot of land to... to um, building of cities or expansion of cities and um, this increased urbanization has caused a decrease in the amount of arable land as well. Um, besides, so not only is your supply of arable land on earth decreasing, but the amount of crops that we can grow per acre has also been stagnating. Uh, while it hasn't decreased per se, uh, it has stagnated in the sense that the we're no longer able to increase the amount of crops that we are growing per acre of land. So. Um, your crop yield has stagnated since 2007 and has not really grown much. Uh, if you were to look at what goes, the factors that, uh, that affect your yield per acre, it's um, dependent on the weather, on water, as well as the use of GMO crops. However, statistically, if you look at the amount of uh, increase yet your your GMO crops are able to increase it's actually been a moderate effect with the weather as well as water having a even a greater effect than than the use of GMO crops so uh, your GMO crops is not exactly a silver bullet for this um, for this problem and even if we were to change all our crops to GMO crops it's not going to significantly increase the amount of crop yield so uh, the more pertinent issues is more climate change as well as uh, the use of uh, water for agriculture usage. So demand for agricultural water usage, you can see in the bullet point there that uh, the UN estimates that by 2050, we're going to need to double the entire world's uh, consumption of water uh, for agriculture use in order to supply that the, the food required. So, um, and then if you were to look, I think at current news, there uh, are certain places that are facing severe droughts, like places in Africa, for example, where some of their dams are drying up to critical levels. So, um, I think climate change has severely negatively impacted the amount of crop yield that we can get per acre. So, you can see in the long run, uh, demand is going to increase and supply is not really rising at the moment to, to meet that demand. So uh, on the shorter term basis, in, when we talk about climate change, uh, you can see in the recent uh, winter for, for the USA, uh, they are facing very harsh winter conditions right now and this has caused the production for their winter wheat to be negatively impacted. Um, the winter came earlier and more intense than expected, so that led to deteriorating conditions for U.S. wheat farmers. Uh, this caused the Kansas City wheat prices to close 8.7% up at the end of February, and the Chicago wheat prices to gain 7.2% uh, at the end of February as well. Um, so with that, uh, you can see that, okay, so at the conclusion for the fundamental side that uh, there are significant drivers for demand in the long term as well as the shorter term um, in terms of uh, demand for, for agriculture to be used in terms of, uh, you know, direct food for us as well as feed for livestock in order to grow uh, higher quality foods as well as a greater demand for, for biofuels, which uh, you can see with the stabilization and recovery of oil prices, that's uh, as oil prices start to rise up again, there's going to be an increased demand in agriculture to be used as a substitute for biofuel. 
Um, as well as in the supply side, you can see that there's going to be an issue in growing the amount of supply we need to meet that increasing demand uh, with the reduction of arable land as well as climate change producing uh, issues in, in uh, yielding the crop side. So for technical side of things, I'll uh, pass the time now to Jeremy in order to uh, talk about what he sees in the chart perspective. Thanks, Kangwe. So Jeremy speaking here. So for my part, I'll just briefly go through what I see on the chart, at least from a longer term perspective first, and then uh, bringing you to where we are right now in terms of uh, seeing some bottoming signal from the Bloomberg Agriculture Sub-Index. So on the chart here, what you are seeing is the monthly time frame chart on the Bloomberg Agriculture Sub-Index, uh, spanning all the way back to 1992. So we do have quite a lot of data over here. And our study has shown that is that the sub-index, the agriculture task, uh, tends to move in this cycle where it forms a cyclical bottom, cyclical low in between every seven to nine years, which means uh, for the whole boom and bust cycle for the agriculture, uh, it takes around nine to seven years for it to form a bottom to the next bottom. So I'll just briefly go through what the chart uh, on the screen shows. So the vertical line over here uh, demarcates the point where we see the uh, cyclical bottom forms. And throughout, uh, since 1992, we have seen two of such cycle playing out right now. We believe we are in the third cycle uh, for this particular move uh, to the upside. And just to highlight, uh, these two horizontal line is kind of important for the uh, agriculture uh, sub-index. Uh, just illustrate the expensive range over here. So any uh, price above this expensive range we, we have seen is around 192. Uh, it's the point whereby we see a huge reversal from a bull market into a bear market. And likewise, uh, at an inexpensive range, uh, it's around 95 to 87. So just to illustrate what it means, or at least the rationale behind why this uh, pattern works is, uh, for example, if price is below the 95 to 87 range, uh, the agriculture sub-index is uh, kind of uh, in a very dirt cheap kind of a price, which then uh, lead to producer cutting back on their production as a... Uh, uh, it's loss making and t tends to actually lead to a uh, over uh, shortage uh, within the market. So as the supply and demand dynamics kind of are clear, where we get uh, shortages, uh, economics 101 will tell us that price will actually hit back into the uptrend in order for the uh, market to clear. So what we see now here at least is that the bottom range of things, once price is below uh, 95 to 87, usually range that is when shortages will come into the market, whereby it's just an uh, eventuality for the uh, bull market to uh, return. So likewise, same on the upside of things, uh, once the uh, price of the agriculture gets too expensive, uh, for example, any number above 192, that is when we will actually uh, go into a period where producer will kind of uh, overproduce uh, to try and lock in the high price. And uh, thus, uh, when we get uh, overproduction, uh, supply kind of exceeds demand and eventually uh, a bear market will kind of take over. So this is what we have seen since 1992 play out pretty nicely in terms of forming the range boundary for the expensive side as well as the inexpensive side. And just to illustrate the whole chart uh, going back to 1992. So somewhere in October of 1992, that was when we first formed our cyclical bottom. And again, like, like I mentioned, uh, once we are near the inexpensive range, a bull market more or less will kind of take over, which usually lasts for around three to five years. And so during this particular circular bull market, uh, we saw... Uh, the Bloomberg Agriculture Sub-Index uh, kind of a rally for 100% or more. And then once it tagged the expensive range, we saw the start of the bear market. So somewhere in 1997, that was when the bear market started, which we saw around 54% uh, uh, sell-off, taking price all the way back to the inexpensive range again. So during this period, it took the market nine years to form the next cyclical bottom over here in October of 2001. And once we tagged the inexpensive range, the bull market kind of uh, uh, returned, and we saw another 100 48% uh, kind of a rally throughout the next three to five years. And again, like I mentioned, you can see this sine wave pattern play out very nicely within the range. And so during this particular bull market in October of 2001, we saw uh, price tagging the expensive range again and subsequently entered into a bear market of around 56%. So these two bear market went down in a range of around 50% or more. And as you can see, it kind of uh, follows this pattern pretty nicely. And again, once it tags the inexpensive range of around 95 Somewhere around December 2008, uh, this particular cycle took around seven years to form. And eventually, once we hit that point, we went on into a bull market again with 100% gain. So the most recent sell-off started somewhere in 2013, where we tagged the expensive range of 192. And since then, we have seen the agriculture sub-index um, falling for around 50%. <clears throat> so 
price action wise you can see a lot of similarities forming for this whole cycle and right now we are tagging the low end of things at 95.19 uh, again if we were to use the January low of 95.19 as the particular cyclical bottom then it will tell us that we actually took around 9 years to form this particular cycle which is similar to the one uh, in uh, around 1992 to 2001 so in terms of cycle wise we believe it's right for our upturn as well as from a price action perspective right now as we are tagging along the inexpensive range of uh, 95 to 87 uh, we believe uh, the Bloomberg Agriculture Stock Index is kind of a right for a circular bull market moving forward uh, and for this particular circular bull market we are expecting a similar run up in price uh, for the agriculture sub index to again retest the expensive range of around 192 uh, time frame wise for that probably again is on average around three to five years so these two particular bull market you've seen over here this 116 percent rally as well as this 148 percent rally took around three to five years to play out so for this particular circular uptrend we are seeing a similar kind of uh, price section uh, of uh, three to five years before we hit this 192 mark so in terms of downside wise, we see limited downside for this agriculture sub index. Uh, and we believe the lowest that probably if it does still continue to fall, probably the all time low of 87.24, the 2001 low will actually be the, the kind of a uh, backstop or flaw for price as this becomes overly depressed whereby shortages will become a severe problem for the uh, physical supply and demand dynamics. Yeah, so in terms of long term picture wise, we are seeing cyclically it's pretty uh, stacking up nicely for a circular bull market moving forward and then bringing your attention to a more near-term picture so here's the uh, Bloomberg agriculture sub index on a weekly time frame perspective so zooming into like what happened for the past six months or so you can see over here uh, the Bloomberg agriculture sub index has been more or less stuck in a range of around 101 to 95 since around September uh, and what happened is somewhere in March uh, this month we saw a breakout of this particular eight months range. So price action wise, at least in the immediate term, we are seeing some near term bottoming signal coming into the market uh, as we get this bullish break above this eight months range. But uh, with the benefit of hindsight, you can see after breaking out, the bullish momentum didn't really sustain. And since then, we have seen price kind of falling back into the range. But it does still provide some uh, clue that market is trying to break higher. So as long as this particular range low at 95.34 holds up, then there is a high chance that uh, we might actually really be seeing a bottom here, uh, a December low of around 95 uh, as the cyclical bottom. Yeah, so all in all, in summary, uh, we believe the Bloomberg Agriculture Sub Index total return is overdue for a cyclical upturn based on our cyclical study. And the current multi-decade low price in the Bloomberg Agriculture Sub Index total return uh, signals physical shortage building up. And our cyclical forecast points to limited downside in the agriculture sub index as price right now is really at a very depressed level at the inexpensive range. And we believe uh, this agriculture sub index do have a strong upside gain of uh, around 100% for the next three to five years to target the expensive range of around 192. So on the fundamental side, several factors may hamper global supply's ability to meet growing global demand in the long term. And the current conditions such as the weather might provide a short term boost for crop prices. So all in all, that is one uh, ETN that actually tracks the Bloomberg Agriculture Sub Index. Uh, it's called the IPAR Bloomberg Agriculture Sub Index, ticker code JJA. And for those that are more uh, interested in looking into individual agriculture commodities, uh, here are four of them that you can actually uh, look into to capitalize on this cyclical upturn. So we have uh, the corn ETF, the soybean ETF, the wheat ETF, and the sugar ETF, which comprises uh, the top four components of the uh, Bloomberg Agriculture Sub Index. And with that, we'll move on to the macro update uh, uh, on last week's FOMC meeting. Some key takeaway. Uh, citing is not around today, so I'll just cover on his behalf. So five key takes away, take away from uh, last week's FOMC meeting. So point number one and point number two has been more or less the trend from the uh, Fed. So GDP growth for 18 and 19 was revised higher due to stimulative fiscal policy, such as your tax reform as well as infrastructure spending. Uh, and then tighter labor market and or commodity financial condition. And on the unemployment side, uh, unemployment rate will be below the longer run rate for the next three years. So you can see over here, the table shows the projection of uh, the December number as well as the most recent number. And uh, the Fed continue to show up a uh, rosy projection for the GDP number as well as the unemployment number, where the numbers are revised higher for the GDP side from 2.5% to 2.7% for 2018. 
as well as 2.1 percent to 2.4 percent for the end of 2019. Uh, this is the difference between the uh, December projection to the most recent projection. And then on the unemployment side, uh, we saw the Fed actually uh, re reducing the unemployment rate down from 3.9 percent to 3.8 percent for 2018, as well as 3.9 percent to 3.6 percent for 2019. So all in all, in terms of these two uh, metric GDP as well unemployment rate, uh, they have been pretty consistent with uh, by upgrading their views uh, for most of their ARP meetings. Uh, but the more important thing to look at is the inflation number, because GDP and unemployment rate has been improving for about the past two to three years, and they have been uh, holding on to that view. But inflation is the reason uh, why they have been so kind of uh, uh, remaining on the accommodative side on their rate hike cycle. So inflation on from the most recent uh, Fed projection, uh, inflation is expected to be above the target rate in 2020 for the first time. But do know that 2020 is still far, pretty far out. Right now we're in 2018, we're talking about like two years out. And during the press conference, uh, Powell did mention that he sees no sense in data that inflation is about to accelerate, which does then lead us to see the projection number for 2018 and 2019 remaining the same uh, from the December projection to the March projection, uh, remaining at 1.9% uh, for 2018 and 2% for 2019. So all in all, I think inflation will be the key thing to look at rather than just GDP and unemployment. So if inflation do get out of control and spike higher than the Fed's uh, projection number, then probably they will be m more on the aggressive side. But as of now, uh, according to what Powell is saying, uh, he's not seeing any uh, sign of accelerating inflation that's coming to the market, which means they will probably remain more on the data dependent side uh, and kind of uh, only react once inflation shows to be a bit uh, coming in at a hotter level than it usually is. So for Fed funds rate wise, uh, what happened is, I think everybody should know this, uh, last Thursday, the Fed actually hiked its interest rate 25 basis point from 1.5% to 1.75%. And right now, the Fed funds rate is at 1.7%. And an interesting thing that was mentioned uh, during the press conference is, uh, Power did drop hints uh, of uh, more frequent press conference uh, but then we refrain from linking more press conference to more rate hikes. So for those that don't really uh, know how the FOMC meeting works, uh, in a year there is a total of eight FOMC meeting, and there is only four FOMC meeting that has a press conference that's tagged along with the FOMC meeting. And it's only usually during the uh, FOMC meeting with the press conference where the Fed will actually announce a uh, drastic change within the monetary policy, such as a uh, change in their Fed funds rate as well as a change in their uh, monetary policy from their balance sheet perspective. So probably this is something to look out uh, for if we do actually get a uh, sudden change in the uh, press conference uh, number for a year. So probably what Power is trying to do here is to keep an option for uh, more press conference so that they can actually react to the market if inflation does get out of control and kind of uh, telegraph to the market that they are ready for more rate hikes. But as of the most recent FOMC meeting, they are trying to downplay that particular linkage between uh, more press conference to more rate hikes. So keep a close look out uh, for new language uh, of whether the Fed will actually go about in uh, implementing more press conference for, for their FOMC meeting. So in terms of dot plot comparison wise between the uh, most recent number to the December's uh, projection, the blue dot over here shows you the uh, December projection uh, for the end of 18 uh, Fed funds rate. And then the orange dot over here shows you the most recent projection for the 2018 Fed funds rate uh, number. So what we see is uh, in terms of the median uh, Fed funds rate target wise for the end of 18, uh, things still remain the same from December whereby uh, the Fed members are all seeing uh, Fed funds rate being at 2.25% for the end of 2018, which would then equate to three rate hikes in 2018. Uh, that kind of uh, was uh, surprising to the market because the market was pricing in or expecting slightly more hawkish tone from the Fed and from the adopt plot projection, uh, expecting for at least uh, some, some clue of more than three rate hikes, probably four, but you, looking at the dot plot projection, it's not really showing it right now. But probably one thing to take note over here is uh, what it's needed to actually move the median number from 2.25% to 2.5% is basically just uh, uh, one member over here uh, from the 2.25% and below to actually shift higher uh, in order for the median number to be at 2.5%. So moving forward, do keep a close look out at the uh, following dot plot projection, whether we do ex uh, see any members shifting their projection up to around 2.5 or even higher, that would uh, shift the median projection to 3 rate hike to 4 rate hike this year uh, with the target of 2.5% or end of 2018.
But another interesting thing that uh, Power mentioned was uh, during the press conference, he downplayed the importance of 2018-2019 dots, uh, saying that no one has the visibility uh, of two years out. So kind of uh, downplaying whatever dot plot projection that is being shown here. So keep that in mind. Uh, in terms of the Fed chair, he don't really see much uh, critical importance from uh, the dot plot projection. But it does give uh, the market some guide in terms of uh, seeing where the Fed funds rate will be for the end of 2018 and so on and so forth. So in terms of the market implication wise from the most recent uh, Fed uh, action, uh, just to show you uh, how we track these things. So this is part of our recession tracker, the Fed funds rate. Uh, Fed funds rate is shown in the orange line and then the S&P 500 is in the blue line. And our study have shown that every rate hike cycle in history tend to lead to some severe market correction, some sort of a market crisis event at the end of the rate hike cycle, where the Fed uh, kind of uh, halts the rate hike cycle and go into a period of uh, rate cut. So just to illustrate what I mean by that is, uh, probably I'll just illustrate one example during the uh, housing boom period of 2000. So somewhere in June of 2004 was when the Fed started its rehack cycle, lifting rates from 1% to 1.25% over here. And subsequently, they continued the rehack trajectory for the following two years, uh, altogether bringing rates up from 1% to 5.25%. And then somewhere in, I think, June of 2006, that was when the Fed kind of uh, halted with the rehack cycle at 5.25% and keeping it flat at 5.25% for uh, one whole year. And somewhere in September of 2007 was when the Fed kind of did something drastic and unexpected. They kind of cut their interest rate from 5.25% to 4.75% uh, in the September meeting. Uh, and that, that's a very big move on their part because the Fed uh, usually only move in uh, tranches of 25 basis point, but during the particular rate cut uh, incident, they took rates down by 50 basis point, which is equivalent to two rate cuts. So the repercussion to the market during that particular meeting was uh, the S&P 500 index eventually formed its uh, crisis top over here and we saw what happened global financial crisis took over and the S&P 500 index 5 fell about 52 percent or so after the Fed signaled that the market is kind of a weakening and they had no choice but to cut interest rates so it this kind of a pattern played out pretty nicely uh, in history same thing during a dot-com period your early 90s recession period your Latin America debt crisis as well as the 73 74 stock market uh, crash uh, so bringing you guys back to where we are right now so the current hike cycle began in 2015 December to be specific where the Fed hiked its interest rate from 0.25% to 0.5% and since then we have seen a few more rate hikes with the most recent one bringing the Fed funds rate up to 1.75%. So all in all in terms of the market expectation wise, uh, the market is still expecting at least two more rate hikes this year and according to the Fed's dot plot projection they are still expecting two more rate hikes this year which would then bring us uh, to 2.25% by 2018. And just to give you guys a flavor, even from the Fed funds rate, uh, I mean Fed, Fed funds futures uh, market expectation, they are pricing in right now about 65% of a rate hike in June. So it's kind of a more or less a done deal that June we are going to get another rate hike. So that will leave interest rate up from 1.75% to 2% uh, in June's uh, FOMC meeting. So what we see is all in all, as long as the Fed continues with the rate hike cycle, with this particular rate hike trajectory, uh, we believe further vote of confidence will then be sent out to the market, which should then do good to the equity market for being uh, in, on a risk on kind of sentiment. And as long as the rate hike uh, cycle continues, we believe the general trend on the equity market should continue to trend higher. But the key thing to look out for again is if we do suddenly get a switch in language from a hawkish language, a kind of a rate hike, kind of a path to a period where we get in action in the Fed funds rate, for a few months and ultimately once we see the start of the rate cut cycle I think that is the point where investors should be a bit more wary of being on a risk on side and probably should look on to uh, risk off side of things once the Fed actually cuts its interest rate uh, in the near I mean in the future out period probably somewhere in 2019 or so so using the Fed as a leading indicator in terms of uh, signaling to the market what's happening I think they are uh, pretty good in catching kind of a market tops by looking at the Fed funds rate. Uh, as the Fed has the smartest people in the room, an army of economies, definitely they know better in terms of the health of the economy. So continue to watch the uh, development in the Fed funds rate, uh, whether we, we will still continue to see the Fed rate hike trajectory continuing for probably two to three more years out, or it does suddenly stop in the near future. Yes, so with that, uh, we've come to the end of uh, today's webinar. Uh, we'll pause right now for Q&A if there is any. Thank you.
Hello, uh, there's a, uh, it's Richard speaking. There's a question uh, on what is the impact to Comfort Delgro if Grab uh, does acquire Uber's Southeast Asia operations. Um, at, at present, um, we are not sure if Grab will be able to acquire the Singapore uh, operations because as mentioned, um, the, during the budget, the government has already articulated that they are not in favour of uh, a monopoly. So uh, based on that, um, we are still adopting a wait and see uh, to get some clarity on whether uh, the Singapore site can indeed be acquired uh, by Grab. And just to add on, uh, as mentioned uh, during the presentation, uh, there could be uh, some positive and some negative coming out from the acquisition of um, Uber by Grab, uh, in that if Grab is here alone without any competition from Uber, then there could be some uh, more rational pricing for um commuter fare as well as a driver incentive. Uh, I think as everyone knows, uh, the commuter fare has been uh, quite cheap as, and there's some quite good driver incentives, but actually the operations is l making a loss. So uh, if there's no competition between Grab and Uber, then uh, perhaps Grab can price it uh, a bit more rational. So, and then that would lead to some demand going back to taxi. So that would be a positive aspect for um, ComfortDelGro. But at the same time, the negative would be uh, Grab would not have any uh, competitor, i.e. Uber, and then Grab would have a monopoly of the private hire vehicle uh, operations in Singapore. And then once it's a monopoly, uh, it could uh, put up a strong um, competition against that, the, the legacy taxi business model in Singapore. Uh, hi, Jeremy speaking here. So there's a question asking how will the current trade war impact the general economy overall? Uh, so what we see at least, the main highlight right now is between US and China. So the first piece of news that kind of kicked off the trade war was uh, US uh, kind of implementing the 25% steel tariff as well as 10% aluminum tariff, mainly aiming at China. And then subsequently what happened is uh, the tip of tech kind of retaliatory action from China saying that they are planning to impose 3 billion uh, worth of uh, tariffs on U.S. imports and ultimately the most recent piece of news from uh, U.S. saying that they are going to also implement probably around uh, 50 to 60 billion worth of uh, Chinese imports uh, based off the uh, theft of uh, U.S. intellectual property from China. So all in all in terms of trade war wise it's definitely kind of escalating from the 10 and 25 percent steel and aluminum tariff that was being first mentioned uh, somewhere around in mid of this month and then since then we have seen kind of a retaliatory 
uh, action from China back and forth and back to US. So with that, I think if it continues to get out of control, you can see right now even the market is kind of reacting to that uh, from the first piece of trade war news uh, starting in somewhere around mid middle of February, I mean middle of March. So if this trade war kind of escalates further on with uh, China imposing further tariff on US imports, I think that will have a pretty risk off kind of uh, effect on the equity market, which we are right now already seeing. And all in all, I think the black swan over here is uh, how this tariff will actually feed back into the high inflation number that uh, the central banks are all kind of yearning. So inflation has been looking for the past few years with so much uh, money being pumped into the market, but now reflected in the CPI number. But uh, if this particular tariff uh, trade war is going to escalate, we might actually see a one-off uh, sudden spike in inflation number as uh, we see a premium spike in 10, 20 or even 30% increase in our food and energy prices based on the trade tariff that has been imposed back and forth from US and China. So in terms of that, the repercussion is obviously uh, not so rosy if that happens, if inflation does really get out of control. Uh, right now, most central banks target 2% as their kind of uh, nirvana number for their inflation target. But if the trade war actually do ex escalate out of control and uh, inflation gets hotter than 2%, I think that might actually uh, dampen the risk on sentiment as the Fed has no choice but to kind of uh, uh, be more aggressive with their rehack cycle and that would actually feed back to a lower equity market as a whole. So I think all in all in terms of trade war wise right now is definitely not uh, showing a uh, pretty good outcome uh, as of what we are seeing. But I think continue to watch the space whether the uh, China is going to impose further tariff at a larger number uh, than what we have seen, the, the most recent 3 billion number that China is planning to do on the uh, US. Uh, and all you know, I think in terms of uh, the longer term perspective, I think uh, relying again back to our recession tracker that we uh, track on a money basis, as of now the recession tracker from the economic standpoint, uh, economic data wise, all the numbers still remain in the rosy side of things. And as well as the market based data still kind of uh, remain pretty rosy. So all in all, in terms of uh, looking at the recession tracker, I think uh, we need to see a few more months of data for the uh, development of this trade war to see if it actually affects the general economy as a whole uh, before we can get to a more conclusive picture of uh, what's going to happen with the equity market. There's a question asking, is there an ETF for agriculture commodity listed in Singapore exchange? Uh, unfortunately, there isn't one ETF or uh, ETF that tracks the uh, Bloomberg Agriculture Sub Index that we are showing here today. Okay, since there are no more questions, uh, we'll end the webinar here today. Thank you so much for tuning in and we hope to see you guys again. For more information, uh, just head to stocksbnb.com. Thank you.